Welcome back to the Federal and Indian Gaming Law. Today we're going to take a look at the Federal Wire Act, really our last look at the Federal Wire Act in depth. And uh, so if you have questions about the Wire Act, uh, this class is a good, good class to ask questions in. So without, without uh, further ado, again, taking a look at the prohibition section of the Wire Act, it's applies to those in the business of betting or wagering that use a wire communication facility for the transmission in interstate or foreign commerce. Again, of bets or wagers or information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers on any sporting event or contest. And then we have these other two prohibitions, the comma ors for the transmission of wire communication that entitles recipient to receive money or credit as a result of a better wager or for information assisting in the placements of bets or wagers. And then we have the exemption section. And what's exempted? News reporting. Again, because you have to be in the business of betting or wagering first, and thinking back to 1961, who would have been in the business of betting or wagering that also was in the business of publishing? Tracks. Uh, and then we have the second or, comma, or, 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 I'm sorry, the first comma over here, or for the transmission of information assisting in the placing of bets or wagers on a sporting events, sporting event or contest from a state or from a country, foreign country where betting on that sporting event or contest is legal into a state or foreign country in which such betting is legal. So again, the information assisting is the only thing that's exempted and it's only exempted between jurisdictions where it's legal we saw the write-up of Robert F. Kennedy regarding the exemption and the prohibition and that example with New York and uh, Nevada with regard to horse racing, that this act would permit horse racing information to be transmitted from New York to Nevada, but it would not allow New York to take bets from Nevada betters. and vice versa. And again, we took a look at that business of betting or wagering. Barboring opinion kind of lays it out, requires the sale of a product or service for a fee involving third parties or the performance. And again, that's an or, the performance of a function that is integral to, to part of such business. Information assisting, we've taken a look at this. Point spreads, account information, odds, basically the information a bookmaker uses to operate their business, as opposed to the bet itself. And we just started taking a look at that phrase, sporting event or contest. Again, pre-December 2011, the Department of Justice's view was, Wire Act applies to everything, it applies to sporting events, wagering on sporting events, which are bets on athletic games, and it applies to betting on contests, which are anything with consideration, chance, and prize. Then along comes In Ray MasterCard that said, now sporting modifies both event and contest. But again, it does so in the context of trying to hold credit card companies liable as part of a racketeering enterprise for illegal acts conducted by merchants. And we went over that whole chain where the merchants have accounts with merchant banks. The merchant banks have agreements with the credit card networks like MasterCard. Uh, MasterCard doesn't necessarily know what the, the uh, merchants are doing. That's the merchant bank's job. And then we have Lombardo. It said, even if the Fifth Circuit is right in In Ray MasterCard, the sporting event or contest language only shows up in the first prohibition, not the other two. And the fact that we have information assisting the exact same language twice in the statute, once with sporting event or contest, once without, the court said that we have to interpret the statute to have meaning, every section to have meaning, and if sporting event or contest were to be read into every prohibition, then the first information assisting and the second information assisting would be the same thing. 
and therefore one would have no meaning. Therefore, we're going to find a distinction where the second information assisting is not reliant on any sporting event or contest. And then we have that change in DOJ view in 2011. So in 2011, uh, the Department of Justice changes its view and says sports only. Until 2018, really 2019, because it wasn't published for public consumption until 2019, where the Department of Justice says something different. But in the meantime, after the 2011 opinion, we talked about the restoration of America's Wire Act, which was an attempt to modify the Federal Wire Act by removing the sporting event contest language, adding a section that said, says all internet traffic will be deemed to be interstate and foreign transmission, whether or not that information crosses state lines. It would leave 1084B untouched. So the exemption wouldn't change. That would still have sporting event or contest. It would exclude fantasy sports betting from the Federal Wire Act with a new section. And there'd be no exclusion for state regulated gambling, which creates some interesting things. So again, you know, let's say your casino wants to bring in a big better, somebody that puts I don't know, 40 to $100 million behind the cage for a weekend. Generally, what happens is you negotiate with these people. You tell them what you're going to provide them, and you're going to provide them with what you expect of them. So, for example, if it's a Baccarat player from the Pacific Rim, he says, I want to come in with $80 million for a weekend. And you say, great, love to have you. We'll match that in credit. Uh, we'll give you a high roller suite or mansion, whatever. Uh, we'll provide all your meals. Let us know what you like to drink. It'll be on hand. Let us know what you like to smoke. We'll have that brand of cigarettes for you. Um, if you're bringing a companion with you, we'll take her shopping or him shopping. Um, and in exchange, you'll play Baccarat for at least X number of hours per day with a minimum hand of X dollars. And they'll sign this agreement and they'll bring the person in. You know, they may send a private jet for them as well. So if you're a casino that's engaged in that high-end part of the business and you start negotiating with that person, are those communications necessary for the continuous service <clears throat> are, are are they help are they necessary for conducting betting or wagering yeah so they're in the business of betting and wagering your casino is a transmission fantasy sports no is that the transmission of a bet no oops it's getting ahead of me here um <laughs> Is there information assisting? You sure hope so. Um, but is it on sports? No. Well, then it's probably exempt. It's probably illegal under the Wire Act if it were to be amended with the restoration of America's Wire Act bill. The hearings were a disaster. I'm going to show you just a quick video. Unfortunately, this video I wasn't able to embed. Let's share this. Uh, share. Let's share. We'll share sound for this as well. Share. All right, are you ready? The FBI had any successful convictions of a regulated gambling operator, or have you seen an increase in criminal activity through the regular? through the regulated gambling sites? I don't have this, the specific details regarding that. I can take that back and okay. see whether uh, that does, in fact, exist. And whether or not
I've heard the testimony. I've been pretty astounding that Mr. Campbell could come representing the FBI to talk about the problems of regulated Internet gaming and not be able to cite a single case in which it's been the problem or give us any statistics that indicate it is a problem. And, Attorney General, how you can use the Tenth Amendment argument to say that federal regulation gives you more states' rights is kind of uh, jabberwocky to me. Were you able to hear that? Yeah, that 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 was the nice part of the hearing. Um, there were other parts where it just really went off the rails. And that act was introduced twice and died twice. So it never went anywhere. But that doesn't mean that the thoughts behind it died. And again, I think we got this far, but for those of you that weren't here, push review of the uh, this is the confirmation uh, hearing of Obama Jeff Sessions. administration's interpretation of the Wire Act to allow to allow um, online video poker or poker gambling. Uh, Senator Graham, I was shocked uh, at the memorandum, I guess the enforcement memorandum that the Department of Justice issued uh, with regard to the Wire Act and criticized it. Apparently, there is some justification or argument that can be made to support the Department of Justice's position, but I did oppose it when it happened, and uh, it seemed to me to be an unusual. Would you revisit it? I, will, I would re revisit it, or, and I would uh, make a decision about it based on careful study, uh, rather than, and I haven't reached, gone that far uh, to give you an opinion today. Immigrant. So, again, at Jeff Sessions, confirmation hearing to become Attorney General of the United States, at least for Senator Graham, this was a very hot issue, hotter than immigration. And again, this is the last administration, immigration played a, a, was a key policy issue for the prior administration. Probably the only thing higher for the last administration was trying to undo anything the prior administration had done. So you can see where this is headed. And in January 2019, the Department of Justice released a new opinion regarding the Federal Wire Act that was dated 2018. Now, again, at this point in time, for those of you that remember, we had a federal government shutdown. So this opinion is published as a slip opinion. And I've looked, I can't find any other DOJ opinions that are labeled slip opinion. Anybody know what a slip opinion is? Nobody? Nobody heard, nobody's heard the phrase before? Courtney? Well, I've only seen it in cases where like it's, I guess it's like the court's decision, but it's not officially published, perhaps? Yeah, it's the preliminary copy of a court opinion before it's edited and before it makes it into the, the reporter. So it might have some errors in it, but the court reserves the right to, to edit it. So you get these slip opinions that come out kind of early, and then eventually you'll get the final opinion, which doesn't have any, any uh, label on it, like slip opinion. But yeah, they're preliminary copies of the opinion before final edit. So first time we've ever seen that, try to call the Department of Justice to see what that means. And you get a phone message that says that the federal government is currently shut down and there's nobody to answer your call except for essential services. Try back some other time. So what does that 2019 opinion do? Well, the first thing it says is there's no tension between the UIGEA and the Federal Wire Act. So it's really trying to undermine the 2011 opinion. And it removes any basis um, for interpreting the Federal Wire Act to not be applicable to intrastate wagering. So it's gonna to apply to intrastate as well. It implies that New York and Illinois can no longer rely on the 2011 opinion to continue intrastate online lottery product sales. So 
How do they get there? Well, they get there by breaking the wire rock up into two pieces, but really two and a half pieces. <laughs> and the first thing they say is the interstate and foreign commerce language only applies to the place the the placing of bets doesn't apply to information assisting. So information assisting, even in interstate intrastate commerce, applies. Therefore, you can't have the bet without the information assisting. So, so that's not going to fly. Um, then it said sporting event or contest only modifies information assisting, not bets or wagers. Following here. And then for the second prohibition, we have the these other two pieces where there's no reference to sporting event or contest. So they kind of square Lombardo in a weird, in, a, in an interesting way. And they do this with talking about the antecedent or the precedent preceding commas and why they count sometimes and don't count other times. And for anybody that hasn't read this opinion, if you're having a really hard time falling asleep one night, pull this out. Put your head to sleep. Now, it's easy for me to criticize. I didn't write it. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't tasked with finding a way to reinterpret the Wire Act. Uh, I'm sure they did the best they could with the time they were allotted, but um, but it's confusing to say the least. And again, there's fallout from this, just like there was fallout from the 2011 opinion. And what the first piece of fallout is that the New Hampshire lottery and one of its vendors sue the Department of Justice. Because again, DOJ has said, New York and Illinois, you can't rely on this law anymore. Now New Hampshire has an actual online lottery product, only available on an intrastate basis. Do you remember what the issues were? I actually have a question um, about the interest state. Is that just to make sure I'm understanding? Is that saying like in Nevada, for example, I couldn't like email someone in Reno and get information to assist in a bet um, because yeah, well, you could. Yeah, and it would make our our remote sports wagering, our account wagering, sports betting prohibited under the Wire Act. Now, again, the speculation about that opinion is that it was written by somebody that was a lobbyist for a large casino operator here in Nevada that um, he was hired by the Department of Justice. This opinion was written and he left the Department of Justice right after. The at least that's that that's according to uh, uh, speculation from New Jersey and Pennsylvania that filed a Freedom of Information Act requesting information about the creation of that opinion. As far as I know, that that, that request has gone unanswered. Um, can't imagine it's classified, uh, but. It was clearly a favor to a significant donor to the then party in power. And they had absolute power. Um, so you get this opinion, New Hampshire sues, and they have two issues. And the issue is one, whether the Federal Wire Act applies to state actors and whether the Federal Wire Act pro prohibitions are limited to sports wagering. And one of the cases they want to rely on is something called Lion. Anybody remember Lion, if you read it? Lion is an interesting case. I, I was consulted on this matter before it went forward. And the attorneys that were litigating this really thought Lion was going to be a great case for them. And what Lion said, what Lion was, was a, a guy that gets arrested for multiple online gambling activities. And he's charged with wire act violation. 
And, you know, he does take bets on sports. He also takes bets on, you know, blackjack, video slots, everything else. And his argument was, you can't charge me under the wire act because I wasn't exclusively doing sports wagering. And um, the wire act only applies to sports wagering. See the in-ray MasterCard case. And the court said, no, that's not how it works. It's not that you have to be exclusively engaged in sports wagering to, um, to be charged with the Wire Act. The fact that you're engaged in sports wagering at all undermines your argument. And counsel for that was lead counsel on this thought that that was great because it really means that the Wire Act only applies to sports. Well, court said, no. <laughs> So at least I got one um, that that language in line was dicta. And on top of that, it doesn't stand for what you think it stands for. It just means that just because you're engaged in other forms of wagering doesn't mean the Wire Act won't apply if you're engaged in sports wagering as well. Then the issue is irrelevant, right? So the DOJ starts, argues that, and they argue that sporting event and contest is only limited to the first information system. By the way, they tried to dismiss this initially. Uh, again, this is a deck relief action. And they said there's no case in controversy because they haven't threatened New Hampshire and even produced a letter saying, hey, we're not going to prosecute you right now. But they go through their argument. And say that you know the information system only applies, or the sports information, sports wagering only applies to that first information system, not to anything else. And the DOJ argues again that the OLC in Office of Legal Counsel for the Department of Justice got it wrong in 2011 by reading that into each clause. Now, I think there were 17 states that filed amicus briefs in this. But the court said that's nice, but this case is just between the parties before us. And our opinion is only going to be applicable to the parties before us. So it declines to hold its opinion beyond the parties. So the 17 amicus, this doesn't apply to you. Um, and then they go on to say that, you know what, <laughs> uh, first of all, that lack of jurisdiction, because there's no case in controversy, that that's not going to fly because just saying that you're not going to prosecute them right now, doesn't mean you won't prosecute them in the future. And then on top of that. The Wire Act only does apply to sports. The 2011 opinion got it right. The 2019 opinion is confusing. It's full of errors. It's difficult to read. The 2011 opinion is more reasonable. Therefore, as to the parties, the 2019 opinion is set aside. So what does the DOJ do? Well, they appeal. And they appeal to the First Circuit Court of Appeals. And the First Circuit Court of Appeals agrees. One, they agree that the holding is just for those parties. Next, they agree that the federal the 2019 opinion is confusing, uh, self-contradictory, and that the 2011 opinion is more reasonable. And they leave the opinion Standing. So because the New Hampshire lottery was not taking sports wagers, Federal Wire Act doesn't apply to it. Now, this opinion comes out on, when was the inauguration for Joe Biden? January 20th, 21st. Came out a couple of days after change in administration. So what did the new administration do with that? 
they declined to appeal it to the U.S. Supreme Court, so they let it stand. In the wake of that, mere days after letting that deadline pass, state's attorneys generals from, I forgot the count, I had it, I had it written down and I lost my notes, um, more than 17 jurisdictions sent a letter to Attorney General Garland requesting that he repeal the 2019 opinion or 2018 opinion. All right, the one that was released in January 15th of 2009, which adopted the 2018 opinion, um, or issue a new opinion regarding the Federal Water Act. And it gets signed by. Well, what's kind of one, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26 attorney, states attorneys general. And this is, again, less than a year old. So it's a hot issue. To date, the attorney general has not repealed that opinion, rescinded it, or issued a new opinion. In comments, unofficial comments, he has said that they have no intention of enforcing the 2019 opinion as written, which has led to another lawsuit, a more recent lawsuit. So in December, or I should say late November, uh, IGT files for deck relief in Rhode Island, which is also in the First Circuit, by the way. And they want the Federal Wire Act opinion of 2019 set aside. Now, last month, uh, early last month, the Department of Justice said it needed more time to answer. And then last week, the Department of Justice filed a motion to dismiss the action for lack of a case in controversy. Saying, we've never threatened I IGT. We have no intention of going after IGT. On top of that, the First Circuit's already ruled in this. We would never go after anybody in a First Circuit, in the First Circuit regarding the 2019 opinion. Therefore, court, you should dismiss. Now, this is an argument that they used before, actually, I thought it would, that that argument would carry the day in New Hampshire, but it didn't, only because the DOJ really hedged their bets on, or hedged their language on saying that they wouldn't sue the state of New Hampshire or enforce against the state of New Hampshire because they said we won't enforce against the state of New Hampshire right now, which the court meant to to be to mean that we, we could in the future if we decide to, which is why it took the case. Here they're just saying we haven't threatened IGT, we never would, we wouldn't go after anybody in the first circuit anyway. You should dismiss this. So I wouldn't read too much into this. It's pretty standard procedure for the DOJ to do this in declaratory relief actions. Because again, you probably learned this as one L's, but courts don't give advisory opinions. They only take cases in controversy. Anybody know the standard for issuing an opinion for declaratory relief or taking a matter on decla for declaratory relief? Courtney. Um, if there's like a likelihood of like immediate and irreparable harm. Yeah. Yeah. There has to be some imminent threat. Um, irreparable harm. So we, we get to the end here and let's kind of take a look at this um, on a timeline. So you get the Federal Wire Act enacted in 1961. You get that Yakinta opinion about any cross-border communication qualifies. 
you know, we have the other opinions that define the information assisting and what it means to be in the business. And things stay pretty dormant until we get to in-ray MasterCard. And in Ray MasterCard, we get sports only in 2001. Shortly after that, Nevada enacts something called the Interactive Gaming Statute. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But interactive gaming is basically online gambling. Well, 2002, DOJ sends a letter saying, don't you dare regulate that. It's all illegal under the Federal Wire Act. So we don't. 2003, Station Sports Connection goes live. Now, Sports Connection was the first account-based wagering platform to use home computers to allow you to bet on sports. The way Sports Connection worked is you had to be in Clark County, Nevada. You had to have a Cox cable modem. And you had to have the Sports Connection live CD in your DVD drive or CD drive. And what Sports Connection did is it activated a, it, it put you on a separate router inside the Cox system. So the only thing you could access through your Cox cable modem while you were using it was the station sports betting server. Couldn't look at anything else, couldn't open up a separate window. If you did open up a separate window and tried to look at things on the internet, you wouldn't get anywhere. Um, the interface was like a, anybody remember text terminals? VT100s? It was in a window, but it was all text-based. No graphic interface. You had to use arrow keys and enter and things like that to move around. But it worked. So we do, we, Nevada does do that. Now Nevada has had remote telephone sports wagering since at least 1972, probably before the first regulations I can find specific to remote, remote sports wagering were from 1972. 2003, after in -ray MasterCard, DOJ testifies before Congress that the Federal Wire Act applies to just, not just sports, but to all forms of wagering, sporting events and contests. Uh, in response to the DOJ letter in 2002, and with some concern that Nevada was falling behind technologically in gaming, Nevada enacts the mobile gaming statute, which is basically online or internet gambling limited to the casino premises. 2006, we get the Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act, which we'll talk about later. 2010, Illinois and New York sent a letter to the Department of Justice saying, hey, we're going to sell online lottery subscriptions on an intrastate basis using an out-of-state payment processor. We don't think it violates the Federal Wire Act. Let us know if you have a different opinion. Um, if we don't hear from you by the end of the year, we're going to assume that you don't. And the DOJ never responds. Well, at least doesn't respond by that time. May 2011, Senators Reed and Kyle finalize a poker bill. So they've got a bill they think is going to make it through Congress to permit interstate online poker between states that regulate the activity. Following on its heels, Nevada enacts AB 258, which compels the Gaming Control Board to draft and the commission to adopt online poker regulations by the end of January. 2012. July 2011, the next month, Senators Reed and Kyle sent a letter to the Department of Justice saying, Dear Department of Justice, please reaffirm your position that the Federal Wire Act applies to more than sports and it applies to those things that Illinois and New York are doing currently. Now, why did they do that? Because their poker bill would permit Illinois and New York to do what they're doing. And if what they're doing is deemed to be illegal by the Department of Justice, it brings them on board for supporting the new bill.
December 2011, December 23rd, to be precise, Department of Justice issues that opinion. It says the Federal Wire Act applies to sports only. Oh, by the way, by this time, the Kyle and Reed bill is dead, even though um, Senator Kyle thought he had the votes on his side. Senator McConnell, who was minority leader, decided that he did not want to support any bill that Senator Reed and President Obama would support. <laughs> so he was not going to allow it to come to a vote, even though the votes were there. Oops, this should have been 02. Uh, that's out of order. Uh, March 2012, Leroy's introduces the first smartphone app in the United States for conducting sports betting. Now, again, intrastate only, seems to comply with the 2011 opinion. Nevada and Delaware in February 2014 sign an agreement for cross-border online poker wagering, again, compliant with the 2011 opinion, but this really sets off one casino owner here in Nevada. And so the Rawa stuff starts shortly after that. Um, there's a lot of noise about it. It finally gets introduced in 2015, it dies. 2018, New Jersey joins Nevada and Delaware for online poker. We get the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act declared unconstitutional. We'll talk about that later. But basically what that law did is it prohibited states that didn't have sports wagering from authorizing or regulating sports wagering to occur in their jurisdictions. Well, January 2019, that new DOJ opinion is published and it covers all forms of remote wagering, not just sports. Then we get the New Hampshire District Court saying, no, sports only, but only as it applies to the litigants in New Hampshire. So we're not going to extend this decision to, to apply anywhere else. First Circuit agrees. DOJ allows that deadline to pass. State AGs ask Attorney General Garland to, to uh, rescind the opinion. He doesn't do so. December... IGT files against the DOJ. And last week, the DOJ filed that they have no intention of enforcing the Federal Wire Act against IGT, and they would never do anything in the First Circuit anyway because of the First Circuit Court of Appeals opinion. And that brings us up to today. Now, when I started teaching this in 2004, this was relatively dormant. <laughs> Uh, from 2004, really, to 2011, it stayed pretty pretty dormant. Um, today, it's hot. It's hot as can be. So with that, are there any questions? Austin. So just to be clear, the Reed and Kyle poker bill was trying to get poker in the state, right? It wasn't trying to prohibit poker? No, what it would have done is it would have authorized under federal law states to conduct interstate online poker between the states in states where online poker was regulated and deemed legal by the state. So for example, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, um, there it would, it, it, it would ensure that no federal laws apply to that activity in those states if they wanted to pool wagering. Let, you know, for example, letting New Jersey betters bet on poker sites in Delaware or Nevada and vice versa, and any other state that wants to do that without having to have a state to state compact. Uh, it also addressed things like taxation, it addressed tri tribal gaming and poker. It set up a federal tax for poker and it prohibited anyone, any state from licensing somebody that engaged in the activity illegally prior to the enactment of the law. Also prohibited licensed operators 
from buying the assets of those illegal operators. Again, back in 2010 and 11, there were three very big online poker sites, Full Tilt, Absolute, and the biggest of them all, Poker Stars. And they were trying to get into the industry. Absent getting into the industry legally, they wanted to be able to sell their assets. And the biggest asset they had were player accounts, player information. And the federal law would have prohibited anybody, would have prohibited them from profiting from the fruit of the poison tree, essentially. And there was a timeout period. So there, I can't remember if it was nine years or 11 years, 10 years, something, five years, where they would be out of the market, period. And then if they could show that they were suitable, they'd be back in. It also had significant minimum standards for regulating online poker and for the regulatory agencies that would be permitted to regulate online poker. And the, the idea there was to prevent a race from the bottom, a race to the bottom. So, you know, for example, a company like Poker Stars could never get licensed in Nevada because of all the illegal activity that had been conducted. Um, but maybe they could get in a tribal jurisdiction or a smaller state that was just looking for money. You know, and then they'd have access to the national market. And Congress wanted to prevent that race to the bottom. So it included language like that. It was a really long bill. Um, again, it had it had enough votes to make it, but you know it is politics, and at the time, one of the tenets of politics for one of the for for, for a very very important member of the Senate was. The other side likes it and the president likes it. We're not going to let it get to a vote unless if I could stop it at all. And he could. So it didn't get there. And, and by the way, that isn't just speculation. There, there was a, a member, a Republican member of the Senate that when he retired, he said that was their whole thing. He said McConnell was never going to let anything hit the floor if he could help it, if the president liked it unless it was absolutely positively necessary to keep the country country solvent. So there is that. Other questions, or hopefully that helps. Help Austin? Yeah, thank you. Good time to ask. This is a, a hot, again, a hot issue. 